on TV uh, because I do like to watch TV. I think some people think, you know, academic is just like sitting in a big lounge chair, you know, reading journals uh, every night. And yeah, that happens sometimes, but usually at night after the kids go to bed, I'm watching TV. And so one of my favorite shows is Mythbusters on Discovery, I think. Do you know Mythbusters? Mythbusters. Um, if, if you don't, basically they, they try to show evidence for or lack of evidence for something that we all think is true. So one of my favorites is, do you know the, the phrase of baseball, you know, he's such a good hitter, he hit the cover off the ball? Okay, so they literally try to hit the cover off the ball on Mythbusters, and basically they found that you need a swing that's at least 200 miles an hour. That is the myth that, that I sort of want to address today in talking about this, this issue of, of interaction. Because I'm ho hoping that at least this myth is dead at this point. And this is a quote from Nicolaus in Genesee. Despite the acquisition of two languages, bilingual children do not appear to be remarkably delayed nor remarkably advanced relative to that of monolingual children. And I think this is particularly acute, obviously, when you're dealing with populations who have some kind of communication disorder. Because I think that the sort of corollary to the myth is, yeah, bilinguals are slower, and they're especially slower if they have some kind of communication problem. So that doesn't seem to be the case. So that's sort of the bottom line take home message from this. So I'm kind of going to, I'm starting by ending in some sense to say that bilingual kids, at least over time, do not look remarkably different than monolingual kids. So the question we have to ask ourselves is why and how, and can we use that? to our advantage in terms of planning, assessment, and treatment. And again, the way that I'm conceptualizing it is the reason, or at least one of the reasons why bilinguals may not be that different from monolinguals is there's interaction both within and across the languages. So I want to show you some evidence now for that as we move through um, uh, evidence from a number of domains of language. Now I will I'll touch on phonology a little bit, but that won't, won't use it exclusively. Historically, there have been sort of two ways that folks have sort of modeled language representation. That is, the way that the languages of the bilingual might be organized. And the first is the unitary systems model, or the unitary system model, where at least initially, when bilingual kids are, are learning language, the two languages sort of exist in one pot or, or font, if you will. And over time, those two languages start to separate to the point where there is kind of no relationship, per se, between them. That is, language A is separate from language B, the, the grammars of each are separate, and kids know with whom to use each of the two languages, which, I mean, we certainly see pragmatically. The international dual systems model, on the other hand, posits that the two languages are always interacting with each other. So there is some separation with language A and language B, but there's sort of a, a semi-permeable membrane, if you will, between the two. So stuff flows bi-directionally from language A into language B and language B into, into language A. Um, you know, as, as we've been here this week too, I've been uh, thinking a lot not only about uh, the talk, but also guacamole. And I, I don't know why guacamole in Mexico is like so much better than anything you can get outside of Mexico. I'm not sure why. So how many people like guacamole? No. <laughs> how many people, you all know the components of guacamole, right? Okay. How many people would just take an avocado, cut it, and just eat it raw? Okay, so less people. How many people would do the same with an onion? Two. Um, cilantro? Just eat plain cilantro? You might. Okay. The numbers are dwindling as we're talking. Right? And to me, that's, that uh, guacamole is uh, my analogy for the interactional dual systems model, that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Right? Each of the components of guacamole, yeah, you might eat, but you might not. But together, it somehow has a flavor that is totally different with all of the ingredients kind of melting together in your mouth for the most amazing kind of taste with but in the thick chips here, too, that's what makes it not, you know, not the toastiest chips. So let's define interaction so we know what we're talking about. All right. The systematic influence, and systematic is important. 
And so I guess I'll read it and uh, then I'll try and deconstruct it. So the systematic influence of the grammar of one language on the grammar of another language during acquisition, causing differences in a bilingual pattern and rates of development in comparison with monolinguals. All right, so there's a few words I want to pick out. Again, the first one is systematic. That is, it is rule governed. There are patterns to it. It's not a hodgepodge of information from one language into the next. The second is the word grammar. Grammar in this case doesn't necessarily mean syntax, but it's the form of each of the domains of language. Okay, so when, when we're talking about grammar, we're going to talk about, again, the, what, what is the sort of makeup of, of each of the domains. It's also important to look at the phrase causing differences. It doesn't say causing deficiencies or causing disorders or causing anything in a pejorative sense of the word. It's not better, it's not worse, it's just different. So, the implications then of this dual systems model of acquisition are, are threefold. One is we can possibly see acceleration between the two languages. So acceleration is an earlier or faster rate of acquisition of bilinguals as compared to monolinguals. So it could turn out that interaction means that bilinguals actually do things faster, have a, a less errors, earlier rate of acquisition than do monolinguals. And uh, the, the reference that you see, Fabiano is one of our former doctoral students at Temple. And one of the things that we're working on now is to, to, to see whether acceleration actually means the same as. Right, so we're extending the definition of acceleration to say, look, if bilingual kids are learning, acquiring language in the same, at the same rate or earlier than monolinguals, doesn't that actually mean that their language is accelerated in comparison to monolinguals? Because usually learning two things takes longer than learning one thing. And here we have at least some evidence that bilinguals are doing exactly the same thing as monolinguals in exactly the same amount of time. So it could be when we see when we see bilingual kids acquiring language at roughly the same rate or even earlier than monolinguals, actually their language is accelerated. So we're, we're continuing to look at uh, look for evidence of that. But the second implication of the dual systems model is what Parody and Genesee call delay. And we're a little uncomfortable with the term delay because what does delay mean to a group of speech pathologists? Disorder, right? That there's something wrong in, in need of intervention. So we've actually changed it to, to deceleration. So we have acceleration, right? Meaning faster. Deceleration, meaning later or slower rate of development in bilinguals as compared to monolinguals. And again, we have some evidence for that, which we're, we're going to show you in more detail in a second. And then finally, transfer, which again, we sort of have renamed as cross-linguistic effects, or sometimes you'll see uh, bidirectional transfer meaning language-specific features found in productions of the other language. So code switching, for example, is, would be a type of, of cross-linguistic effect or, or bi-directional transfer where there's influence of, of one language on, on the other. So the question is, are we seeing these three implications, these three sort of patterns of development in bilingual kids, and are we seeing them across all domains? Again, providing us some evidence that the languages are not simply operating as separate entities, but are working together to create uh, perhaps a more efficient linguistic system. So again, bilinguals can acquire their language in roughly the same amount of time that, that monolinguals do. So if we look across the, the domains of language for, for evidence of acceleration, deceleration, and transfer, um, there, there is evidence for it. So if you look at uh, Marino's very early study of syntax in monolinguals and bilinguals, you have the case where, in fact, in terms of the rank order of acquisition, some aspects are absolutely commensurate between the two. That is, they're acquiring them at roughly the same time, like the active tense, for example. Um, and gender were acquired commensurately, that is, in roughly the same time frame. 